Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Samantha Politics, A Balkan Crisis Looms. This is your source to learn about global politics. We have an amazing guest with 30 years of experience working on the Balkans, waiting to come on the show to break it all down for us. I know the Balkans can be really confusing, but between her and me, who used to live in the Balkans, hopefully we can help you make sense of what's going on and understand how it relates to you. This show is produced by Stream Inspectors, the leaders in live stream production, and is sponsored by the Women's Leadership Challenge, a program for women to step into their power and learn how to create institutional change. If you like this show, please consider becoming a subscriber on Patreon, patreon.com slash samanthropolitics1, and hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube or on Spotify or Apple. Please also hit that subscribe button and give us a five-star rating so that it can be recommended to other people if you do care about lear people learning about the rest of the world and understanding how it relates to them. Often American can be very myopic, and it's my goal that we're able to understand the rest of the world in a nuanced way. So let's get down to business. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson first, because as I mentioned, the Balkans are extremely confusing. So Zach, if you could put up that first map. So after the Allies won in World War II, Yugoslavia was set up as a federation of six different republics, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and Slovenia. Two autonomous provinces were established within Serbia, Vojvodina and Kosovo. In the 80s, Albanians within Kosovo, which is the major majority group, had started to demand or ask that they become a constituent republic, starting with protests in 1981. Now, there was a big turn in 1987 when Slobodan, Slobodan Milosevic came to power in Serbia. In the meantime, this guy named Tito, you can, Zach, we can see Tito. I love that photo. He just looks so stern in black and white. Tito was basically kind of considered the, the father of Yugoslavia. And he was majorly thought of as somebody who was holding these pieces together. And it, it, at the time during you know, this period from the late 1940s to the early 90s, there really was supposed to be no talking about the ethnic differences within the country. And Yugoslavia under Tito was considered to be really one big country, even though there were ethnic and separatist flames but nothing like what happened in the early 90s. Well, Tito dies, the Berlin, Wall, the Berlin Wall falls, and everything starts to fall apart. So what happens first? So Slovenia and Croatia declare independence. And Zach, you can start that slideshow if you haven't already, but Slovenia and Croatia declare independence, and then war started to follow because Serbia, which was also had been Belgrade, which is the capital of Serbia, had been the military capital of the former Yugoslavia. So all of the military might and all of the tanks and weapons were concentrated in Serbia. And Serbia really considered itself like almost like the owner of Yugoslavia. Like we get to dictate what anyone does and you know we essentially want all of the territory. So tension soon broke out and war started to break out between Serbia and Croatia. Well, then Bosnia decides it's going to succeed and be its own country. Milosevic, who by many is considered an ethnic entrepreneur, which basically means he fanned ethnic flames and history to try to legitimize the Serb invasion of Bosnia, he decides he is going to cleanse Bosnia of all ethnic, uh, what's called, of all Muslims who are called Bosniak. So if someone's called a Bosniak, it means that they are a, a Bosnian Muslim. So to get a little bit complicated, what's a little bit complicated is that there was a bunch of, uh, uh, there's a lot of Serbs that were also living in Bosnia. And so people, it's not like the U.S. or in the U.S., for the majority, if you're born within the U.S., you say, I'm an American. You might say, my parents are Polish or my grandparents are Polish. But if you were born on U.S. soil, most people consider themselves American. It's not like that in the Balkans. So there was a huge region in Bosnia where people may have been born in Serbia, they may have been born in Bosnia, but they still consider themselves ethnically Serb, not necessarily Bosnian. So what uh, Slobodan Milosevic also did was he enlisted not only the Serbs living in Serbia, but the Serbs that were living in Bosnia, again, they might have been born in Bosnia, but still considered themselves ethnically Serb, to, uh, to declare war against the Bosnians. 
there was a horrific siege of Sarajevo and the stories from when I was living there are just horrific of having you know no no water having to walk for miles to get water uh, there's a a book about the uh, the siege of Sarajevo called uh, that's basically talks about how people used to run across the streets because the way you can see in some of the photos, the way that Sarajevo is situated, Sarajevo is in a valley. And so it was really easy for the Serbs to surround the city of Sarajevo and to shoot down into it. And so what they would do is they would shoot when somebody was crossing an intersection. So what people would do is they would stand at the side of the street and then wait and then basically run across the intersection and hope that they're not going to get shot. And obviously many died. The fighting didn't just take place in Sarajevo, it took place all over Bosnia. Now in Sarajevo, there's red splotches on the ground of paint to represent where people were killed during the war. Uh, Zach, you can show that map of 1993 and how much the Serbs were able to incur into Bosnia and how they had the siege of Sarajevo. Uh, well, so this came to a head with a very, very famous event, which was called Srebrenica. What exactly is Srebrenica? Well, the UN declared a safe haven in Bosnia. At the time, the US didn't want to get involved, mainly because we had just had a failed attempt in Somalia where we had something called the CNN effect where one of our soldiers was dragged behind a, um, I think it was a vehicle, um, was, you know, beaten and killed within the street and was dragged within the streets of Somalia. It was all over the news and it was seen as an embarrassment for the U.S. So that meant that we didn't want to get involved in places like Rwanda and Bosnia. So as the U.S. is kind of hemming and hawing about what to do, the UN was also kind of doing the same. So the UN finally says, okay, well, the UN charter actually says we can only fire in self-defense. Meaning if I am a UN peacekeeping force, I cannot fire unless my life is being threatened. If, you know, I'm here to, this is the problem with the UN. If I'm here to protect someone and he is being shot upon, but I am not, the UN charter actually says that you're not supposed to shoot unless you are being threatened. So the UN decides to set up these safe havens for Bosnian civilians as the fighting rages on. So I think it was about 18,000, or excuse me, 23,000 uh, men, women, and children are put in buses and they're put into, or no, it might've even been 30,000. There was a lot of people were put into these UN safe havens, one of which was called Srebrenica. Well, the pact, as it was supposed to be, was that the Serbs were not going to attack Srebrenica that they were going to let Srebrenica be because it was all civilians. Well, that's not what happened. The Serbs come to the town of Srebrenica as the UN is supposedly protecting Srebrenica. They round up all of the men and boys into buses. They drive them into the woods. And then in a campaign of mass murder and genocide, they murder about 8,000 um, men and boys uh, in a matter of days. Some of the reports uh, is that they were killing them so quickly and just literally shooting them in the head and putting them in mass graves that even the Serbs who were shooting them got sick of shooting and were like, can we have a break? Because there was so much bloodshed and it was just so vicious and fast the way that these people were, civilians were being slaughtered. So Srebrenica marked when finally the Serbs committed genocide. For some reason, the U.S. has to wait until all these people are killed to eventually wake up and be like, oh, maybe we should do something. And even then, we don't always do anything. So the U.S. finally realizes, uh-oh, this is not good. Like, the U.N. is declaring safe havens. The, they're not even able to protect the safe havens. The U.N. basically stood by while this was happening. Interestingly, in the past like 10 years, it was majorly, if I'm not mistaken, Dutch peacekeepers that were there. And the Dutch government officially gave an apology to the Bosnians for essentially really doing nothing while the men and boys were being bussed out to be slaughtered. So this served as a wake up call to the US and to the rest of the international community that they finally needed to get involved and that this wasn't just going to go away. And that Slobodan Milosevic, who was, again, the head of Serbia and was in charge of all of this, was not going to just say, OK, goodbye. So what happens next? The United States sends in Richard Holbrook, very famous United States diplomat. 
and he negotiates a ceasefire and a peace accord within Bosnia, which is known as the Dayton Accords. Now pay attention to the Dayton Accords. The Dayton Accords come back. Now the Dayton Accords were great in that they brought a ceasefire, right? People stopped being killed. But what it did was it established an area within Bosnia called Republika Sprska. And you heard that right. The Bosnian language um, seems to have no vowels, as most of the Slavic language do. It's spelled S-P-R-S-K-A. So it established this semi-autonomous region within Bosnia called Republika Sprska. And it established a tripartite presidency of Croat, basically having a, a three presidents within Bosnia, one coming from the Republic of Sprska, who is now um, Miran Dodik, and then one coming from Bosnia, and one coming from uh, the Croats. Now, this ended up being a problem later on. Why? Because by creating a tripartite government, what actually happened is they said, well, if you're a Jew or a Roma, or you don't identify as a Bosnian, a Serb, or a Croat, you actually can't run for president. So this was brought to the European Court of Human Rights, and they actually ruled that this is illegal, that the way that the Dayton Accords were set up was actually illegal because it excludes people who aren't Bosnian, Croat, and Serb. Now, keep in mind, the Dayton Accords were created in 1995. Okay. So what is going on now in Bosnia? And then we're going to get to Kosovo. So what is going on now in Bosnia? So in January, uh, okay, so Dodik, who is the uh, head of the Republika Sprska, has essentially been threatening to take Republika Sprska, which is majorly Serb, and secede from the rest of Bosnia. Unclear if he wants it to join Serbia, be autonomous, or whatever it is. But he has been threatening this for a long time, but his rhetoric has been growing stronger and stronger. So in January, there were demonstrations all over the US and in Europe um, in 35 cities across 14 countries to basically oppose Dodik's moves towards secession. What else happened? Well, something that has just leaked in the last month, which is wild, is a new plan to uh, basically introduce electoral reforms that go against the European Human um, European Court of Human Rights rulings and would actually further enfranchise ethnic tensions in a place that does not need further enfranchisement of ethnic tensions. Now, what exactly is the electoral system looking to change? Well, it's looking at... Um, it's looking at essentially further homogenization and potentially of a, 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 a Croat entity within Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is not, has never been the case. So this is extremely controversial and we're gonna bring in Tanya to do a much better explanation of that than I just did because it's extremely confusing if I'm gonna be completely honest. But that's now provoked massive, massive outcry Keep in mind, Bosnian elections are in October. So this reform is coming out three months before. So let's um, now think about second step, Kosovo. What is going on in Kosovo? Well, Slobodan Milosevic in 1995 was essentially in some ways appeased in the sense that we were kind of playing Mr. Nice Guy because we were getting Milosevic to stop aggressing against the Bosnians and to stop killing people. And we just wanted the fighting to stop. So we didn't really hit Milosevic with what we, I think, needed to hit him with. And so guess what happens in 1999? He decides, well, guess what? Now I'm gonna try to invade Kosovo because there's also Serbs living in Kosovo. Does this sound like someone else you know? Yes, that's right. Sounds a little bit like our friend or not friend, maybe Trump's friend, Vladimir Putin. You you appease them, and then all of a sudden they decide they have more expansionist tendencies, and they're going to go just like um, just like Putin went into Georgia. All of a sudden he went into Ukraine. You appease these people, and they just keep on going. So he decides that he's going to invade Kosovo. Now this time the U.S. wisened up a little bit and said, "Okay, we don't want to be witness like we were in Bosnia, and you still have Clinton as president because he's a two-term president." This time, the U.S. reacts more quickly 
and a NATO force, which was majorly led by the U.S., uh, bombs Serb military targets and basically, you know, in a, in a much um, in a much quicker way than we did in Bosnia to get Milosevic to stop attacking Kosovo. So I just wanted to show these pictures because I think they're really interesting. Zach, if you could put up those two pictures of Department of Defense in Serbia. So when I was in Belgrade, I was walking down one of the main streets in Belgrade and I just see this, you know, huge government building and it's just smashed. And I'm wondering like, wow, looks like a bomb dropped on it. Well, it did. That was the Serb Department of Defense or excuse me, Ministry of Defense. It was, so then the next picture is me asking a police officer, is this the Ministry of Defense? And he says, yes. And I said, well, why did they leave it there? And he said, well, either the Chinese were going to build hotels with it, or we were going to raise it to the ground, or we're going to leave it there as a reminder. And I think what it stands as a reminder of is that Serbs are still very anti-American. And Vucic, the president of Serbia, is very closely aligned with, you guessed it, our friend or not friend again, Vladimir Putin. So Alexander Vucic is allied with Putin, and they're also both allied with Dodik, who's now the president of Republika Sprska within Bosnia. Hopefully I haven't lost you yet. So Kosovo, um, the, the hostilities were stemmed in Kosovo in 1999 with the NATO airstrikes. And Milosevic did pull out of Kosovo, of course, after many people were slaughtered, women raped, people killed. It was not a good situation. Then Kosovo declared its independence in 19, excuse me, in 2008. Since then, Kosovo has not been recognized as a formal state by the entire world. It's been recognized by most of Europe, namely not Russia or Serbia, obviously, by the and by the United States. But it's not necessarily seen. It doesn't have um, ownership within the UN. It doesn't have membership within a lot of international bodies because it's not recognized as a country by still a lot of areas of the world. So what is happening in Kosovo that just broke the news? Well, Kosovo decided that they were going to have Serbs have Kosovar license plates, meaning they can't have license plates that differentiate them in Kosovo just because they're Serb. Again, you have the same situation as in Bosnia, where people might call themselves Serb, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're born in Serbia. Many were born in Kosovo. They just consider themselves ethnically Serb. So this whole thing came out with gunshots and violence because the Kosovar president said, you have to change your license plate to be normal Kosovar license plate. Now, in Serbia, Kosovars have to have Serb license plate, but for some reason, this was seen as a double standard. So that provoked all this violence in Serbia. The U.S. went over to try to appease some of the violence, and then there was a 30-day waiting period to try to work some of this out. And now that's what's going on in Kosovo. The same time, Alexander Vucic, who is the president of Serbia, has now, emboldened by Putin, is now saying things like he, you know, wants to do what Milosevic did, which is go take, you know, get autonomy for the Serbs within Kosovo. Again, very Putin-esque, very much screams of Crimea, um, of Ukraine, of, oh, you know, I want to protect the ethnic Russians within the Ukrainian territory. So all of this is happening within the perfect storm of the Ukraine war, where Putin tried to take over all of Ukraine, you know, inshallah, thankfully, unsuccessfully, although he has, you know, taken a large part of the East and the South, or is taking it as of right now. So that's where we are today. And I'm going to now, um, oh, and uh, one more point is to note is that the that C Serbia and Belarus are the only two countries within the Europe, the only two that have not declared sanctions on Russia. Even Hungary under Viktor Orban, who's a populist jerk, uh, has declared sanctions on Russia. So this is also shows how closely aligned Serbia and uh, and Belarus are with Russia, although I would argue that the Belarusian people are not allied with Russia, just the head of um, the illegitimate head of Belarus is. So I'm going to take a breath and let the actual expert come in and talk to us. I'm so privileged to have Tanya Domi, uh, Professor Tanya Domi, 
uh, speaking to us. You know, ever since I've known her on Facebook from when I was serving in Sarajevo, I'm like, this is the expert on the Balkans. She knows everything. She's always there. She is like the voice of the Balkan region in the United States. And so I just feel unbelievably privileged to have her here to help us understand this on a deeper level. She's an adjunct assistant professor of international and public affairs at Columbia and a faculty affiliate of, uh, affiliate of the Harriman Institute, where she teaches human rights and IR in the Balkans. She's also a senior fellow at the Alliance for Peacebuilding based in DC. She also worked for the U, uh, US representative Frank McCluskey, serving as his defense policy analyst in the early 90s during the run up to the Bosnian War, which I spoke about. She also served in the OSCE mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina as spokesperson, counselor to the head of mission and chair of the OSCE Media Experts Commission. She has worked in Kosovo, Mon Montenegro and Serbia on democratic economic media and political transitional development. She also served 15 years in the US Army and is a graduate of Columbia University where she had, has an MA in human rights. She's a widely published author and has appeared in Foreign Policy, The New York Times, Atlantic, Haaretz, and you know, a bazillion other publications. So Tanya, I'm so privileged and lucky. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Samantha. So first of all, did I miss anything historically that you think is relevant to today that you think people should know? I think, sorry, I gotta get uh, squared away here. Um, I think that, I think what's really important to understand is that how Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia broke up was through calculation. And it was by, uh, Milosevic and his proxies who wanted to create a greater Serbia. The legacies remain and the legacies remain of the Dayton Peace Accords because it basically ossified or more or less kind of put things into a framework that really now I think separates people from each other. And it's really stovepiped Croats, Serbs and Bosniaks uh, in ways that don't no longer serve the country. Um, and I would, I would also add you, I mean, you made a really good point of it, but there's some really bad actors among them include Putin, Orban, including Erdogan, who has a very mm. interesting relationship with Serbia. You would think that, um, he would be investing more time and money into Bosnia, but that is not the case. He's the biggest donor uh, uh, from Turkey to the Balkans is Serbia. Very interesting. Hmm. Interesting. So what, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just done. Can you explain these electoral forums? Cause I really feel like I botched it. <laughs> Can you explain right. it a little bit better? <laughs> well, it's, it's an interesting thing. So this all started uh, when the United States, when, when Secretary of State Tony Blinken sent a letter to the Council of Presidents uh, in March of 21. And he said, essentially, we want to work with you. We look forward to working with the Bosnian government. We want to address corruption and we want to address electoral reform. And uh when when that happened, then there was uh, an initiative by the State Department led by uh, former envoy Matt Palmer to Bosnia. Uh, he was later accompanied by Angelina Eichhorst, who was representing the EU, and they began shopping this electoral reform around the region. Now, when this happened, when the letter was sent, I, uh, I actually, with my colleague, Ivana Stradner at AEI, we actually wrote uh, an op-ed about this moment that the Americans simply, their proposal did not really meet the situation in Bosnia. It had been under siege and threatened by Serbia, uh, not, not by Serbia, rather Russia, the proxies of Russia, including Alexander Vucic, the president of Serbia, and Milorad Dodik, who was a member of actually the joint presidency of Bosnia, and 
Dragon Chovic, who's a hardline Croat affiliated with the the uh, Croatian Democratic Union Party, a right wing autocrat. And they've worked very carefully with Lavrov as the Russian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. And indeed, uh, Mr. Dodik has flown to Moscow. He's gotten uh, awards from from uh, Putin. And um, as a matter of fact, after elections uh, in the last elections, that Vucic was successful in being really, uh, uh, he really was elected with a huge advantage, not in 22, but in the previous elections. He immediately flew to Moscow to consult and get advice, as he was quoted as saying, from Vladimir Putin on the outcome of his government. So this they have worked tirelessly against the sovereignty of Bosnia as well as Kosovo. And as you, as you mentioned, Kosovo is not recognized by Serbia. They are also blocked. They have been blocked in international organizations, the UN, uh, including, um, uh, you know, UN agencies, they're blocked from everything. And uh, they, they've made agreements that Russia will block them wherever in the international organization. So they're also not a member of OSCE either. So, 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 what were the electoral reforms that the U.S. was shopping around? Sure. So the electoral reform is essentially a Croat cutout. It's a. It's like as we would say in American electoral language, it's a gerrymandering of the federation entity, which is the, the Muslim Croat entity, uh, uh, to give them much more significant power and presence. And actually, in a way to further uh, eradicate participation. And it does not make sense. It does not make sense. And the reaction, so first of all, the U.S. has pushed this, push this, push, push and, and this. And why, why are we, I don't understand. It's like we've spent yeah, I'm sorry. Let me get money uh, yes. pouring this. Why are we pushing this? But okay, so I'll stop. So, I'll stop but and, but and, I'll also and, say, I think it was a reaction by the Americans. They actually, I think, believe that the Croats and the Serbs say we're going to boycott elections. And, the, and Dragon Chovic was really hardline about it and said, we will boycott elections if you do not give us this electoral reform. And, and what's, uh, I think the Americans think that they can make a deal and that when the elections are over, they can walk away and said, we made a deal and everything's fine. And that the Croats will really cooperate with the Bosniaks and the Serbs uh, within the government and stop the obstruction. But but we know that that's not the case. There's a great track record and the public has absolutely rejected it. So, you know, the, the so, okay, actually, I, I wanna go to this question. Yes. You know, in your piece in Foreign Policy Magazine, I have to be honest, like I was struck by this um, because I know that you're not an alarmist. And you say in your, your article, although Bosnia and Herzegovina has avoided full-scale war since 1995, the country has never been closer to another ethnic crisis than it is today. That's, 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 that's a huge deal. So what made you, and maybe there's multiple pieces of this, is mm -hmm. it the reforms? Like what made you say that after 20, you know, no, 30 sure. years? How many years is it? 30 years. 30 years. Uh, when you will date and it's, it's a little bit less. But let's just look at the situation. Angela Merkel was leading Europe. Germany was uh, part of the uh, provisional, I mean, they were part of the Peace Implementation Council within the office of the high representative. And she treaded water for six or seven years. We, the United States, was attacked on 9-11 and when that happened all of our engagement in the in in bosnia and in the region really shifted out towards afghanistan and iraq it it i mean it, that's logical but uh with u.s investment there 
it, it basically just ignored it. And it's not benign neglect because whether there's a vacuum, Vladimir Putin, Erdogan, and Il and Orban, who rose in the EU despite all the measures, all the measures that were in the toolbox, they did not take action to stop him from creating a single party authoritarian state right in the middle of the EU. So uh, democracy demands to be defended. And in this region, um, as you mentioned about Kosovo, there is a K4 NATO uh, presence in Kosovo. And I think that's actually keeps danger at bay there, quite frankly. Uh, and in the past several years, many of us Balkan analysts have called on the U.S. government uh, and to reinforce UFOR, which is a very small force. It's about now it's about uh, about 1,500 soldiers uh, with a NATO reinforcement in the Birchko area. For example, probably an infantry brigade size 5,000 soldier presence. So, so do, we, do we have um, people in? Um, do we have people in Bosnia right now? No. Besides, I mean, besides the embassy, we don't besides, have. Any no, no, you force okay. there. That's what's there. And w the irony here, and let me just draw some uh, parallels with Ukraine. We had been saying for a long time, Russia's a threat. Russia's a threat. Russia's a threat. Russia invades Ukraine. Sadly, we believe that. Ukraine affirms our position about how much is at risk. Now, EU air airspace is blocked and Russia can't get to Kosovo or Bosnia, but they will certainly use their proxies. And, you know, just recently, uh, this past spring, the Russians threatened BIH Bosnia and said, if you want to uh, join NATO. That's your choice. But we'll tell you, we will respond. And we point to Ukraine as an example of how we Ooh, might respond. That is like, that's, was that Putin that said that? I mean, that is, that was the minister. Yeah, that gives me chills. I mean, that's yeah. terrifying. Western response was very good. I have to give, give it to everybody, the U.S., and, and, and all the Western uh, presence, you know, with embassies in Sarajevo. But it's very clear that um, Bosnia is being squeezed uh, and Russia is very, very active in undermining it. Mm. So what do you think of, so, so it sounds like the U.S., I mean, from what you're saying, has just kind of like almost forgotten about the Balkans? in a sense, and, but then at the same time as pushing this Croat referendum, like, are we, do you think that the State Department is like oblivious that there could be a, you know, a, 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 a um, reconfigura reconflagration of tension? Or do they think that Dodik's rhetoric of seceding is BS? Like, what's the, is what's, what's, the, what, what is the psychology? I'm a little lost. Well, I don't know about the psychology, but I'll tell you this. This is what I think. I think it speaks more broadly to Biden foreign policy. Mm. Uh, the priority, of course, they had to make Ukraine a priority. They absolutely had to. They had no choice. But if you look even at the Middle East, you know, everything is like, let's manage relationships, but let's not initiate any big undertaking. And I think um, for a diplomatic effort carried out by competent diplomats would have a, a big payoff in the Balkans. And one of the ways that Kosovo could be more engaged here is right, up until recently, the EU has managed the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue. And it, it's been futile. And most people do not think it's going anywhere. But the United States said, oh, EU, you take that on. I think it behooves the United States to get in on that dialogue and help resolve some of these issues that can be resolved. And the same thing goes for Bosnia. Bosnia has, and, and I think the State Department right now would say, oh, well, we are paying attention. They are paying attention by pushing uh, this electoral reform that they went silent on 
uh, Mr. Uh, Palmer is no longer engaged in that activity anymore. I coursed has also disappeared. And, who and was, can you just tell tell everyone who um, Mr. Palmer was and what I course is? Sure. So Matt Palmer uh, was a State Department, uh, you know, a Deputy Assistant Secretary. He was given the title of envoy to BIH on electoral reform. And Angelina Eichhorst is an EU diplomat, Dutch. And they were uh, coming from, you know, they would fly in and they would then make the rounds and talk to whomever would listen to them. And they also were negotiating with the Croats in Zagreb. And this very much upset people in Sarajevo. I mean, very much. And so I thought the choreography was really bad. And another uh, moment came this so they, just, they were just flying around just to look good? I mean, what's the... Well, what they, they, they also met with the political party leaders in, in, um, in the United States. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the political party leaders in Sarajevo. And it was like five guys in a room. And the reaction was terrible. It included uh, the former US ambassador uh, and, and Palmer and all the five male leaders of the political parties. And people were saying, what is going on here? They didn't meet with any citizens groups. They didn't meet with uh, people in the federation parliaments or in the house of peoples they only met with the heads of the political parties Interesting. And, and and women were excluded and some of the women politicians in bosnia became absolutely irate about this and they ended up trolling palmer on twitter i mean it was awesome. really, it was really interesting to see that happen i've never seen any us uh diplomats trolled uh on twitter before what did they say i mean what, what they basically the said you should come and talk to me i'm an elected official why are you ignoring women interesting there and so eventually he he and i course disappeared and then suddenly last month uh there was a leaked memo out of the office of the high representative that indicated he was going to impose this law and can that you, caused- Can you explain, Tanya, sure, who sure. The, what the office of the high representative yes, is? Yeah. So the office of the high representative was established by the Dayton Peace Accords. And this person is responsible for all the civilian aspects of implementing Dayton. It remains, um, it remains relevant because as you as you've indicated there is a lot of tension and right before uh, the the current the current high representative is christian smith who was nominated by angela merkel he was a member of cdu and mm -hmm. he was a minister of agriculture uh which i found very interesting which really equips him to deal with foreign policy yeah and especially as complex <laughs> as the Balkans. That's ridiculous. So he took over a year ago, August this month, and uh, his first public appearance was in Belgrade to endorse the Balkan Open Initiative, which is an economic framework that many people feel put Serbia in the driver's seat to control the economy, along with the Albanian prime minister, uh, and a lot of people are quite dubious of it. Apparently, the State Department also backs this. Curious gets becomes more curious. So he shows up there, and then he he comes to Sarajevo, and I just think he's really badly handled the rollout of his uh, you know first year and imposing imposing in the threat to impose caused major demonstrations in Sarajevo where the office of the high rep was was surrounded by up to 10,000 people for oh. over a week and he backed off with technical changes he saved face by putting in some anti-corruption aspects to the electoral law but what he's proposing actually changes 
the, the House of Peoples and actually changes the constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there are some legal experts in the EU that believe that won't pass EU review, uh, which is also very interesting. Interesting. Now, what is the, the relationship between, is or is there a relationship between uh, Miloran Dodic threatening to secede and the electoral reforms like proposed? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, he makes lots of threats, and um, he is probably, he's not said so publicly, but he probably has said privately, and he supports the Croat initiative. And if you go back in time, if you look at contemporary history, Tujman and Milosevic had a famous incident where they were at having dinner and they called it the napkin map. And they they put together a map on how to chop up Bosnia during the war. And so the Croats- just for, just for our, um, so Tujman was the president of Croatia when the Dayton right. Accords were being negotiated just for our viewers. Yes, and who is now deceased. So uh, he, so there's a tradition and there's a practice between the Serbs and the Croats cooperating against the Bosniaks in Bosnia. So you outline a couple other things within your foreign policy piece, one of which is calling into question Slovenia's rotation as president of the Council of the European Union. I was wondering about that. What? Why? Well, uh, it was like a year ago. Um, I think Slovenia is now rotated out because it goes from 1 July to 1 July. Ah, okay. Uh, I think. But a white paper suddenly circulated. And the Albanian prime minister actually said, I saw it. And the Slovene prime minister was circulating it. And it basically called for breaking up Bosnia. I mean, it, it was shocking, shocking. And so he, so that was part of the op-ed. We said, somebody should talk to him, find out, verify where this memorandum came from. And really, does he have any business being the president of the EU? Um, I, we don't think anything came of it, but it did, that, that went away. That issue kind of fell out of the news cycle and it wasn't really brought up again. Now, can you help us understand a little bit of um, how much of U.S. sanctions? So the U.S. has basically been sanctioning Dodik for a long time. First of all, why have we sanctioned Dodik, and what have the, has the effect been? Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Dodik was initially uh, sanctioned by the Obama administration in January 2017 as they were walking out of office. Uh, it came very late. Uh, they sanctioned him because of his threats to the sovereignty of Bosnia and his, his active undermining of the Dayton Peace Accords, threats to peace and security of Bosnia. And then again, and I give them credit for this, he has, as you said, he has repeatedly called for secession and says he's going to do it. And he actually made moves. He really wants partition so that he would take over all the state agencies that actually reside in the RS entity. Uh, and he's really proposing partition. That's really what he wants. Uh, and, uh, they did it again. They did it this past, uh, they did it in June and they sanctioned him again for the very same reasons and for corruption and his manipulation of a media outlet that has quite a bit of reach, both in print and video. And he, they also sanctioned uh, a number of individuals that are close to him in his circle of influence. So was it effect? I mean, have they been effective? Yes. And then, and then I'll just follow up very quickly. The UK followed the U S on the second sanctions and they too sanctioned, uh, Milorad Dodik. Yes. His rhetoric really cooled off. Most recently he has stopped calling for secession. Although recently he said, 
I'll wait and see about secession. In the meantime, we'll wait for Donald Trump to return in America to the presidency. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hopefully Mar-a-Lago will prevent that from happening. <laughs> this is true. So, and, 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 and to be honest, I mean, Kosovo and Serbia, that really wasn't advanced under the Trump administration. They attempted, uh, they attempted so-called diplomacy there, and it ended up uh, having a, a vote of confidence in Kurti, who is the prime minister, now actually had lost in the vote of confidence. It was early in his first uh, tenure, and then he did, he was reelected, but he blames, and a lot of the choreography around it, he blamed the, the, uh, the Trump administration for putting him in a terrible situation and then actually having to call a vote of confidence by their initiatives that they were pushing that, that put the Albanians really in a no-win situation. Mm. So I, I think, you know, a lot of uh, damage was done to, to Kosovo at the hands of the Trump administration. Mm. Now, what is the, uh, how serious do you think are the threats about Vucic against Kosovo in reference to the whole license plate debacle? Yeah. Well, the license plate debacle started because when Kosovars crossed the boundary into Serbia, the Serbian police would take their license plates off the cars. Uh. And so, so then Kurti, who's not going to back down, he is not meek. Uh, I think the Americans are upset with him. Uh, of course, the of course, the Serbian government doesn't like him, but he's not going to roll over and say, we're going to take this anymore. And um, I think it's a matter of dignity and respect. And I'm not sure there's full emotional appreciation for that by the diplomats. But that being said, uh, he, um, he basically responded in kind and said, okay, this was last year, you want to come across, guess what? We're going to take your license plates off too. And that mm -hmm. happened last year. And that's what accelerated and escalated the tensions at the border. And that's when Vucic put combat aircraft up in the air over the border. Is that the first time that Vucic has put aircraft over the border? Yeah, that was the first wow. time. It was a year ago. And and Vucic, I mean that's that in itself is it's a real escalation. That is that it that's huge. I mean if that's it's you know, a real it's a real escalation and it's dangerous because uh, Vucic did win the last elections this year uh, in April, but he lost a majority, almost a majority of the Belgrade. Uh, he was in a coalition with the socialist uh, socialist party it was Milosevic's party. Uh, he's got a very virulent right wing to his right, to his right. Uh, there's a very tiny, tiny uh, political space there to maneuver the opposition from the liberals or to the left of him is almost non-existent. And um, I think that he's cultivated this anti-Kosovo, we'll never give up Kosovo, you know, we are Kosovo, all these things that he is, he is cultivated and groomed with his base. I just don't see him ever walking away from it. Uh, there is a group of municipalities in Kosovo, and there is an agreement that they can all be in a, in a Serbian municipal association, but it's not gone further than that. But there's, there's really no, uh, there's really no, uh, cooperation and these these dialogue talks have gone nowhere. And the dialogue talks you said are led by who right by now? The, by the EU. And it was Miroslav Lejak who was doing uh, most of that negotiating. But Borrell 
Joseph Borrell, who's the foreign minister of the EU, has kind of said, well, we're really committed to this, but they really haven't moved anything forward. And that's why I think the United States should get some skin in the game here and join, because as I told you, but with, uh, not with not with Palmer in charge. I'm assuming. Well, par I don't think. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm not sure where Palmer is at the moment, actually, and I don't, I don't even know if he's in the State Department now. But but I will say, I will say this. I mean, uh, Chris Hill, uh, very good choice by the Biden administration to hire him as our ambassador in Belgrade, and he has made two comments at least two times. Uh, about the Vucic, about the direction of the Vucic government. And as I said to you, um, there is a saying about Vucic is that he straddles its two legs on a stool between Moscow and Brussels. I would add it's three legs. But Hill has contested that, especially after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and says, there's no way forward for Serbia in an alliance with Russia it will not be able to uh, improve its economy, better itself within Europe. And as you said, it's only Belarus and Serbia that have refused to apply sanctions and he's surrounded. So I think he has to be somewhat uncomfortable, although many people have told me he just doesn't care. And that's mm -hmm. sort of that attitude, we'll do whatever we wanna do. Uh, I think stopping short of going to war because K4 is there and that's important. And the and US- who is, who is K4, Tanya? K4 is NATO, is NATO and there are American troops still there in Kosovo. And the United States most recently said, if Serbia acts uh, with aggression against Kosovo, uh, NATO will defend, will defend Kosovo. This happened just recently. It was kind of wow. not, not overlooked by the media because so much is going on right now. With Ukraine. So do you think, you know, so Kurdi uh, has actually came out to an Italian newspaper uh, only two days ago saying, um, if we have an, another episode, for example, in Transnistria, then the probability that the third wo world war will happen in the Western Balkans, and especially in Kosovo, will be very high. How likely is that? I mean, that's, again, a very strong statement. I, I did see that. I think I think everybody, I'm sure the American ambassador has talked to him about that need to dial this rhetoric back. The rhetoric between Vucic and Kurti responding is very, very dangerous. It's, it's, it's inflammatory. Very inflammatory. And I would argue, and some of us do, you know, that teach IR or have views on this where we may be already in a third war, world war, It's but it's a low level for, I mean, it's, this is taking nothing away from the suffering of the Ukraine people, but it's right now a war between Russia and Ukraine with NATO in defense uh, encircling. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's a really difficult situation, but I do think because all eyes are on Ukraine, I will give credit though, the EU sent 500 soldiers to reinforce U4 on the first day of the war with Ukraine hmm. to Bosnia. And then the Germans who made the promise in December last year said, we want to reinforce, they sent an additional 500 this summer. So that's good, but it's not enough to protect Bosnia from an incursion through, um, as you know, Birchko uh, from that direction. And also Orban is a malevolent uh, actor here and has given support and sustenance to Dodik. He's flown in to Banja Luka from Budapest for pictures, for photo ops, and saying, if you get sanctioned and you're and the EU pulls funding from you, we'll replace it with our money. Wow. He's already said it. Wow. And, you know, Viktor Orban, who, again, for our listeners, is the president of Hungary and populist jerk. Um, it, he, what, why if he's Dodik, Dodik's ally and Vucic's ally and Russia's ally, frankly, or I guess not Russia. Why did he why did they decide to put sanctions on Russia? That was surprising to me. That's a really interesting 
question and I can't really answer that, but I mean, I, I think that he looked around and everybody was joining. I mean, I was, to be honest with you, given how slow, slow the EU has been in the Balkans. And also I've been, you know, disappointed with the U S foreign policy in the Balkans. I was really surprised by the strong response. It's unprecedented. Uh, some people in Bosnia remember what happened to them. They didn't get a response like that. They actually got an arms embargo put on them by the world. And uh, nobody came to their defense initially. So they called that progress and they were they congratulated Ukraine and the world has learned something. The world has learned something since Bosnia, you know, was basically destroyed. Uh, so I think it's a, I think he looked around and the, it, it was so quick, you know, it, it, the response was so quick mm -hmm. and so unanimous. I think he felt he had to get on board. Can you tell us a little bit more about women's leadership in civil society over there? Yes. yes. Well, first of all, let me just say, before, before I get into that, there's a new generation of women. Uh, people, uh, it, uh, it, they are, they're post, they, they may have survived the war, but they were young. And they're now in the Federation Parliament and in, in Bosnia and in the uh, House of Peoples. And in Kosovo, you have the second, not the first, the second woman president right. and a lot of women in the Kosovo, uh, in the Kosovo parliament, that's very impressive. So I just want to say that. So that's a new level of political engagement and also power. It's power mm -hmm. to persuade, but lot for a long time in the Balkans, in Serbia, uh, many, many powerful very strong civil society leaders. And I think they hold these countries and these communities together. Sonia Biserko, very well known in the Helsinki Commission in, in, uh, in Serbia, uh, a very dense NGO population in Serbia, advancing human rights, the Youth Initiative for Human Rights, which is in Sarajevo, Zagreb, uh, Pristina and Belgrade. Uh, it was a domestic initiative by the playwright uh, Andre Nosov, who set up what's called a Heart of Fact Foundation, and and many women leading uh, the youth initiative. And you know, I'll speak very directly and openly about someone in Bosnia. Her name's uh, Velma Sadic, who is president and co-founder of the Post-Conflict Research Center in Sarajevo. Uh, full disclosure, I'm president of its advisory board, but this is someone who just received the local peace builder awards from the Alliance for Peace Building in Washington, which I had nothing to do with. And she probably is one of the most uh, well-known growing profile of somebody who says, I'm committed to building a culture of peace and does it in multiple, multiple ways. I think she's really, and her organization works uh, throughout the region and beyond. Uh, we're seeing some really powerful examples of women's constructive, positive leadership in the Balkans. It's always been there, but it's never been fully appreciated, I think. And something else that you wrote an article about that I think is important to bring up is the you know, in terms of transitional justice is the prosecution of rape during the during the Serb incursion into Kosovo and also into Bosnia. And you write in one of your pieces that uh, 20,000 rapes of Kosovo women were carried out by Serbian soldiers and police, but to date only one has been prosecuted by a court of law and it is now on appeal. What is That's, going on there? Okay, so uh, this is something I care very deeply about having worked and lived in Bosnia and the estimates was 25 to 50,000 women were targeted by Serbs, Bosnian Serbs and Serb nationals and to their mm -hmm. great credit and great courage, they testified, they, they actually persuaded the prosecutors to take on 
rape is a war crime. Uh, a judge and a lawyer in Priador that were in a rape camp took witnesses in the refugee camps in Croatia and flew to The Hague and presented these witness statements and said, you must do this. And they did. And mm. so uh, the so first- that, That's why the, they decided that rape was a war crime? Is that well, what you think? Yes, that was one of the first things. And also there was a first decision by the Rwandan tribunal in 1998 that found a public official, his name was Paul Akaseyu. He was the mayor of a small town. He ordered rapes and they convicted him of genocide and rape was a component of the genocide and it was determined to be a war crime. But in the Focha cases, Focha Bosnia, where there were rape camps, there was a major landmark decision delivered in a 2003 and it was determined that rape was a crime against humanity. Rape was a violation of the torture convention. They were illegally detained and enslaved. And that indeed it was determined in the Kerstich, uh, Kerstich General Kerstich was also tried and convicted of, uh, of genocide. And the rapes that took place at Srebrenica at Srebrenica in the morning of July 11th, they were also determined to be part of that genocide conviction. And so these are all landmark decisions in the history of civilization. It was not addressed until the ICTER and the ICTI tribunals. It's remarkable. But what happened with ad hoc tribunals tribunals that are not established permanently, but have a period of time, it came too late for Kosovo. They, the mandate ran mm, out for ICTI. Meaning the ICTY was over at that point and therefore well, didn't... They did prosecute commanders for command responsibility of the rapes in Kosovo, but they did not prosecute any individual rapes. Oh, and so right now we have what's called the KLA court. It's in The Hague. It was established uh, by Dick Marty, an EU, um, an EU politico. Uh, there was the feeling that, okay, Kosovo's not gonna prosecute their own, the, the Kosovo Liber Liberation Army uh, actors that probably violated war crimes, committed war crimes. And so, okay, we're going to establish this court and it's going to have international staff and judges and it's going to prosecute the KLA. So I recommend, along with my co-author Hikmet Karsic, that the KLA court's jurisdiction be renegotiated because the U.S. is one of the funders of that court. And it's about time that justice comes for these victims. It's been over 23 years. And one woman who's now an American uh, has testified before Congress and we have met with the House Foreign Affairs Committee and now there's a resolution in the House calling for prosecution of all, all uh, acts of rape during conflict. And they also mention Ukraine in that resolution, but this is specifically about the Kosovars. Wow. So the, so I'm trying to understand, so what would be, because there was a huge systems change within the ICTY. That's of, right. You know, understanding that rape was a war crime, of it being prosecuted at all. That's right. Witnesses. That's right. What, so what could the, the change be if the KLA tries these cases of rape? Well, not the KLA. Not the KLA, the, sorry. So the no, KLA no. tribunal. And the tribunal, excuse yeah. me. The KLA tribunal. Yeah. Um, well, what the change would be is that they would broaden their jurisdiction beyond just the KLA. We're talking about lots of crimes, not just women mm -hmm. and people who were raped, but how many victims are there in um, Kosovo that will probably never get justice. And there's right. a paucity of courts that the international, uh, you know, the ICC is not likely to take up these cases given what we're dealing with in Ukraine. And I think what you're going to start seeing more of is what actually just took place in Germany, which was a great 
a great improvement is that in Germany, they actually just prosecuted an ISIS fighter for rape, enslavement, and trafficking of a Yazidi mm. woman. And I think you're going to start seeing more cases by state, yeah, state courts. Yeah. Yes. When I was in graduate school, um, I basically, because I mean, the other thing that's I think is important is that the way that rape and sexual assault cases need to be prosecuted is different. Yes. So what I actually argued for in my final paper for my international law class was that there should be a special court that just is created specifically for the war crime of rape. I, I actually thought about that and actually was going to write an op-ed about no that. Way. But, I'll send you my paper. We okay, can, send me, give me, maybe we could write it together. Go it. Uh, I, but let me also say before I get away from this is it's really important that people understand, well, so what? What about all these crimes? Well, not only did these crimes happen, Serbia has never acknowledged its responsibility in Kosovo or Bosnia. And there's a term that we are now using and we're actually paying a lot of attention to. It's called genocide denial. And not only is it genocide denial, but genocide denial says, oh, that never happened. Oh, that you weren't a victim. Oh, the, the ICTI court, that didn't happen. They didn't decide that. That actually prolongs and extends the denial of justice to the victims. Mm. And uh, what we also have is the phenomenon of triumphalism, which is the celebration of war criminals, which happens in Zagreb mm. quite a bit. And it happens in Belgrade as well. And that during the Srebrenica co uh, commemoration, and I was just there on July 11th, there was an action by local Serbs where they posted all these signs of dead Serbian soldiers on the road to Srebrenica as Ooh. a way to, to basically insult one of the most somber days of the year Ooh. in Bosnia. Ooh. So, so genocide denial and its celebration of war criminals is a real thing. So, why, why are you? How can you have peace when, when the aggressors, the people who carried out these crimes, the states that sponsored these crimes, refused to take responsibility? Right. right. It's and very and I, think, I feel like we actually, I forgot to make that point in the introduction that aren't part of Dodic secessionist um, rhetoric about the fact that, um, is it that Bosnia is saying that genocide denial is illegal or what, what was that? Okay, so sure. So right before uh, Christian Schmidt took over, the previous high representative, uh, his name was Martin Insko, he actually imposed the law. Uh, against genocide denial and said, if, if you're um, guilty of it, criminal penalties can apply. And so that was imposed. And it's unfortunate that it came in his last three days as a high representative. And so when Christian Schmidt walked in, you can imagine that polarized, I mean, it, there was an absolute outrage by Dodic and said that he, and then he reiterated, I will secede immediately. We will not accept this. Um, so I think that this is part of undermining Bosnia. And as long as there's that open wound and Dodic, he, he says it was a crime, but it wasn't genocide and refuses to acknowledge all the rapes, I mean, all these women have never been apologized to. So in Bosnia or in uh, Kosovo, those wounds go deep. Those wounds go very deep. And all the people who were tortured, all the people who lost. I know people in Srebrenica that lost over 60 family members. Wow. And we're talking about when I first got there in 96 and went from Bialina in the northeast corner of Bosnia down to Trebinja, which is at the bottom of Bosnia with a USAID officer. We were serving radio and television stations at the local level for, you know, technology. And I was simply blown away by blown away by 
house after house destroyed, the roofs blown off. They de they they designed a, an effective way to. They knew how many charges it would take to blow the roof off, and it would be inhabitable. And they would come in, take over the town. They would uh, separate uh, families. They would uh, rape the women. They would plunder the home. They would plunder home. They would take valuables. And they were sold on the streets of Belgrade, as an example. Wow. So, so people, of course, uh, left. You know, there were two million refugees and one hundred and ten thousand dead in Bosnia. They went to over eighty countries around the world. I knew that because they had the right to vote, and I was working at the OSCE, and we held elections. And so, diaspora to this day can vote in the Bosnian elections if you're Bosnian Croat or Bosniak or whatever you, if you were living there when the war happened, you can actually vote in the elections. And um, so, but people left and, you know, it worked. And if you look at the Holocaust, it worked, <laughs> you know, in Europe, Jewish culture is quite diminished because there just aren't that many Jews still living. I mean, there are Jews, don't get me wrong, Berlin. No, there well, is. But it's, but it's a, but, it's a shadow expat yes, community. Yes, of, yes. It's not the it, same. Yes. So I would just say that, yes, they, and so that's one of the reasons, and I'm glad we're talking about this. That's one of the reasons why there's such an incredible reaction, negative reaction to this electoral proposal, because I don't think that Christian Schmidt or even the Americans have full appreciation what happened in Bosnia, that people were wiped out and that they're not effectively uh, represented. And what's what's also wrong about this is that there is a Croat president. His name is Jelko Komsic, but he's not a nationalist. They want to create a constituency so they get a nationalist. Mm. So they reject him as a Croat representative. Mm. Fascinating. So, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to ask you one last. Well, actually, two last questions. Sure. Can people support the Post-Conflict Research Center? Is that an NGO? Is there like. Yes, it, it is an NGO, but it, it it's not registered in the United States. But okay. but um, I can share I can share the. Yeah, we'll put the website in the comments in the okay. chat. OK. Um, and then the last question I have is. Yes. Why should Americans care about this? Well, I have to tell you, uh, when I first went there in 96, uh, I was really proud of America. And we, and I went there, I had worked on the, on these issues on Capitol Hill with Frank McCloskey, who became the conscience of the house on Bosnia. Uh, and, uh, America was seen as, a savior, even though right. Srebrenica happened, they the people really looked up to America. And wherever America is at the table, even to this day, and I think in diminished leadership, quite frankly, given I think our very, very uh, middle of the road kind of, oh, we're here, but we're, we're not really up to doing anything. Um, there's still seen as very important. And I think Bosnians have been rightfully uh, disappointed. In Kosovo, probably the most pro-American country in former Yugo, is whatever America says or does, they, they are going to, to do whatever it takes. Albania as well, of course, it's not part of the former Yugoslavia, but they also are very pro-America. So the payoff in the Balkans, these are also, I want people to know that there are about 300,000 Bosniaks that live in America. Mm -hmm. And they're in, they're in our communities from Astoria, Queens, to Utica, New York, to Jacksonville, Florida, to Des Moines and Waterloo, and in St. Louis, the largest population of Bosnian, Bosniaks outside of Bosnia. They live all over the country, and they're part of our, our American fabric. And they're very proud Americans. 
And what they're very, I yes, they're very proud Americans. The same thing for the Albanians. Wow. In Staten Island, Kosovars and Albanians, where I live in the Northwest Bronx and Riverdale, many Albanians from Kosovo and Albania proper. And I have to say, the industry, their initiative, their can do is as American as apple pie. And these are great, these are people that came here as refugees for the yeah. most part, fleeing war. And this is, I believe that. Dayton deserves to be fixed. Americans need need to, I think, finish the deal. They probably disagree with me on this, but I think it's really important in, in terms of our leadership in the Balkans. And if we're seen as pushing back on this irredentitism and this uh, autocracy from Orban and Putin, uh, it matters. It really matters. And you don't have to put big armies in there. You can just do your job effectively as diplomats and use the tools that are available within our own government. And I will give them credit on the anti-corruption initiatives. Let's see how it goes forward and how it's utilized and implemented. But it is a good initiative. Well, I think we're going to have to close it there. Uh, this was fascinating. Uh, and complicated and uh, frightening, frankly. Um, but so many important issues raised from, you know, prosecution of rape cases to the possible conflagration to, yes. you know, uh, to alliances, to the failure of U.S. policy. Uh, I mean, I've heard so many, you know, just fascinating things from you. So I really want to thank you for taking your time tonight to break it all down for the audience. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And I'm going to send you my paper so we can write yeah, our op-ed together. Yes, about, why not? The why International not? Criminal Court for, yeah. um, for rape. I agree. I agree. All right. Thank okay. you. Have an amazing you, night. Sam President yeah, thank you, Samantha. Well, that was Professor Tanya Domi, who teaches at Columbia and also in the Balkans. She is a preeminent expert on the Balkans, as you can see, and has served across different Balkan countries, really gave us a sobering take on what's going on in the region and also what the U.S. can do better to try to stem that, as well as shedding light on transitional justice uh, within Bosnia and also Kosovo and how can we bring more justice to people that were, uh, were raped, abused, tortured within those eras and how important that is. So, so many important things there. I want to thank you for tuning into this episode of Samantha Politics, and I want to thank our sponsor, Stream Inspection. They are the leaders in live stream production. If you want to have a professional looking show instead of a grainy Zoom webinar with robots asking questions that nobody actually listens to, then you need to hire um, Stream Inspectors. They are amazing, uh, really just phenomenal producers. I'm so lucky to have them. I also want to thank uh, the other sponsor, which is the Women's Leadership Challenge by Empower Global. And you might notice in this promo video for the Women's Leadership Challenge, someone that you recognize. So Zach, can you roll that? I took the Women's Leadership Challenge in early 2021. Samantha told me before I started that this could possibly change my life. And you know what? <laughs> I think it might have done. It gave me the very breakthrough I needed. It fulfilled me in so many ways. Find all my senses through this class. So welcomed me just as I was. I believe that we need more women leaders in the world. Women leaders who lead in innovative, creative, courageous ways that are true to who they are, that aren't a manufactured version of what a man would do at the top. So we're going to do things like finding your purpose, but we're also going to do things like looking at how do you create institutional change. Your cohort will become your sisters that will support you, elevate, lift you up. I highly recommend that any woman who's looking for a pivot, looking for a boost, feeling imposter syndrome, definitely recommend the Women's Leadership Challenge. It's really been a wonderful, life-changing, empowering experience, and I hope that you will join it as well.
I want to thank Mary Page Rousey, who is the amazing uh, producer and editor behind that video, who took all sorts of random photos and videos that I had in a file and actually made something of them. But yes, that is me in my other job when I'm not uh, dissecting U.S. foreign policy. I do teach women how to become feminist leaders like Tanya Domi and how to create institutional change, how to understand and find who they are and then charge forward authentically as new the new type of leaders that we need in this world, the not Putins and the not Vucic's, but the, you know, the, the, the Jacinda Ardern's of this world. And that's what I'm training. That's what I'm teaching. We have two cohorts, uh, in the fall coming up, one is a virtual cohort, which means you can be anywhere in the world. And one is an in-person cohort here in Washington, DC every other week. And it's an amazing community of women. You're not just taking a course, you're really joining in this incredibly empowered network of feminist leaders all over the world who are creating change and supporting one another to create that and change. So I encourage you to check it out. We only have three spots left in the virtual cohort and we only have three spots left in the DC cohort and there will not be any other cohorts until the spring. So if you want to do that, check it out at www.womensleadershipchallenge.com. If you like this episode, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We need your help to support production costs. Good journalism doesn't just happen. These shows take a lot of time to produce. We really appreciate your support. And you can support us at www.patreon.com slash Politics. That's S-A-M-A-N-T-H-R-O politics um, one. And you can also click that subscribe button on YouTube. Share this episode with your friends or people that you think it's important to know this. Subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts if that's where you're listening right now. And thank you so much for being here with us and for caring enough to learn about the rest of the world because the rest of the world matters. And we cannot have this myopic perception that it's you know only America out there because what happens in the rest of the world affects us. And we need to understand what's going on. So thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode of Samantha Politics. Good night, everybody.